Hadi Radiant, and we're just greeting all of you who are in our watch parties all over Southwest Michigan and maybe even some other cities, and those of you who are extended family and friends that are in different cities, different nations. You know, one of the things that's been uh, a uh, pleasant surprise that none of us could have planned on in the middle of the last four months of a pandemic is the reach that we have been able to have into different nations, into different cities, different streams, different people's lives that have joined us online as we've been continuing to gather online, really growing our family. And so wherever you are today, we just welcome you. We're so glad to be with you and to study God's word together. And uh, we are looking forward to our night of worship uh, at 6.30. We are sold out. But uh, that's only for the in-building experience. You can join us online wherever you're at. You can even have a worship party, have some people over, and we're going to worship the Lord together. Pray, prayer and worship are two of the foundational values of Radiant Church, and uh, we're excited to begin the process of, of also regathering in our buildings as much as we're gathering online and uh, about four and a half months ago, or about four months ago, when this all took place, the Lord spoke very clearly to me to teach out of the book of Exodus, and that is where this entire series, Out of Egypt, has come from. It's been a prophetic series where God is really speaking to us about bringing us out of each of our own personal Egypts, our mindsets, our attitudes, and in the middle of incredible difficulties and wilderness wanderings, letting God prove himself faithful, confront the idols of our own life, and become people marked by his presence. This is the last uh, lesson or the last message out of this series, uh, and we're going to be looking at the book of Joshua. So if you have your Bibles, open them to Joshua chapter 1, and I've entitled this weekend's message, Preparing to Cross Over. Preparing to Cross Over. Over And we're going to read, beginning in verse number one, the first nine verses out of Joshua chapter one. And it says in verse number one, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness of this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea towards the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all of the days of your life. And just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give to them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you, and do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now these are the words that God spoke to Joshua as he was beginning to become the key leader of the people of God. This is exactly 40 years after Joshua being one of the 12 spies had gone into the promised land the very first time. And you'll remember the story that out of the 12 spies that Moses sent in to scope out the promised land, only two came back with a good report, and that was Joshua and Caleb. The other 10 brought a bad report. The other 10 came back and said, it's a land that devours its inhabitants. 
Those who live there are the descendants of the Nephilim, the giants in the land. Yeah, the land flows with milk and honey. Yes, the produce is amazing. Yes, it's beautiful. It's everything God said it was, but there's absolutely no way that we can go in and possess the promises. What we need to do is we need to appoint a leader, somebody who's gonna take us back to Egypt, where at least we know that we were gonna have food and at least we know what to expect from day to day. And what they did so displeased the Lord because of their doubt and their unbelief and because of their challenging the very character of God. That entire generation was not allowed to go in and inherit the promised land. An entire generation of 40 years. What took place after that event was God led Moses and the children of Israel wandering in circles in the wilderness until an entire generation died in the wilderness. Their corpses fell in the wilderness, except two of the spies. Everybody 20 years and older died in the wilderness. Those that were 20 years and younger, they were qualified to go into the promised land. Caleb said of him that there was a different spirit in him, and Joshua, both of them gave a good report. Faith rose up in their heart, and because of that, God said, you're the only ones who are gonna go in. And so here we are 40 years later. Moses has led them for 40 years. I don't know about you, but I can't possibly fathom what it was like to be on a 40-year camping trip with 200 complain or 2 million complaining children. But somehow, Moses made it all the way up to the end, and if it had not been for a violent outburst of anger and striking the rock, which we know from our previous study in 1 Corinthians, that rock was Christ, he struck the rock instead of speaking to the rock. God wasn't, wasn't desiring that Moses would just do what he's always done. He wanted him to be obedient to the voice of God. And one time God said, strike the rock, but now he said, speak to the rock. Moses strikes the rock in his anger, and then God says, Moses, you're not going into the promised land. I'm gonna let you see the promised land from the hill country. And so at the end of Deuteronomy 34, we see that Moses goes up into the wilderness. He's standing on the mountain in the Transjordan, and he's looking into Canaan. He's looking in to the very land, but he knows he's not going in. He hands off the baton of leadership to Joshua, and Joshua is left with the people on the banks of the Jordan River, encamped, waiting for instructions, and verse number one comes along. Moses, my servant, is dead. This is God's message to Joshua. Moses, my servant, is dead. It's time for you to arise and lead these people over the Jordan, all of these people, into the land that I've given to them as an inheritance. Joshua finds himself in a critical moment where he has been commissioned by God to take the people of God, a younger generation who's risen up, and to help them to cross over to help them to cross over. It's gonna take some preparation to cross over. It's gonna take some consecration to cross over. But the time has come for them to cross over. And the one thing I know is that over the last four months or so, there's been a lot of things that have been going on in the natural world. And if we are only appraising what has taken place over the last several months and weeks, if we only appraise it according to the flesh, then we're looking at the world the same way that everybody else is looking at the world. But if we've been looking at what is happening through the eyes of faith, and even making the distinction between what God has caused and what God has used, in our lives, in our community, in our culture, in our church, if we're looking through the eyes of faith, then what we know is that God has been preparing us. God has been challenging us. I believe that the days that we are in and the days that are coming are gonna be maybe more challenging than anything that we've ever seen before. Just as Joshua was about to lead the children of Israel into the promised land, there were still giants that were waiting for them in the land. They hadn't gone away. There were still cities and fortresses that needed to be defeated. They were gonna do that by faith and not by might. They were gonna have to possess the land. They were gonna have to pull roots 
and rocks and stumps and they were gonna have to plant seeds. There was difficult times that were ahead, but they were days of promise. And in the same way, I believe that there's days of promise that lie ahead for us. And the things that we have learned in how God has brought us out of Egypt and the things that we have learned in the wilderness wanderings are the things that prepare us to consecrate ourselves now for the days that are coming. Another way of saying crossing over is to overcome. To overcome. To cross over the Jordan River meant that they had to go through something or over something. Another way of saying crossing over is overcome. And Jesus had a lot to say about overcoming. In the book of Revelation, when Jesus speaks to John to give him seven letters to seven churches, every one of them ends with a promise. And the promise is this, to him who overcomes, to all seven churches that represent seven church ages and represent seven church conditions, Jesus has a promise attached to those who will embrace an overcoming mentality. Here are the promises. In Revelation 2, verse 7, he says to the one who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life. And then in chapter 2, verse 11 of Revelation, Jesus said to the one who overcomes, he shall not be hurt by the second death. And then he says in 2, 17, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a new name written on a white stone that no one knows. In 2, 26, he said, I will give you power over the nations. I will make those who overcome be clothed in white garments. I will make them a pillar in God's temple. And I will, and this is maybe the greatest one of all, he said, I will grant to the one who overcomes that he will sit on my throne with me just as I sit on the throne with my father. In other words, he's gonna be above and not below. He's gonna reign and he's not gonna be dominated. There are promises that God has for you and I if we will embrace an overcoming mentality or a crossing over mentality. But it's a decision that we have to make. See, there's two mentalities that we see in Joshua, right in verse number one. There's the Moses mentality, which is a salvation mentality, and there is the Joshua mentality or the overcomer's mentality. Now see, what Moses was great at was getting the people of God out of Egypt, out from under the bondage of the devil, out from under the bondage of their sin, out from the bondage of a death sentence to hell. That's a salvation mentality. But a salvation mentality or a Moses mentality was not going to get them in to the promised land, which represents a state of spiritual maturity, of the promises of God coming to their full maturity. It takes a Joshua overcoming mentality to get them actually matured, consecrated, and ready to cross over and to cross in, to overcome so that they can possess the promises of God. And put it to you this way. Moses could get them out of Egypt, but he couldn't get them into the promised land. Why? It's because one was the salvation only mentality, and Joshua represents a different spirit. Deuteronomy 34, in verse number nine, when it describes Joshua, it says that the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom. He had a different spirit, a spirit of wisdom. And what I believe with all of my heart is the spirit of the living God is challenging the church right now in saying to the church, especially us here in America where life is pretty good, or at least life has been pretty good. He's saying this, what got you into the kingdom will not get you into the promised land. We've got to move on from just having enough to get us saved so that someday we'll go to heaven when we die 
And we've got to shift gears into spiritual maturity so that we can possess the promises that God has for us and the purposes that God has for us here on earth. Yes, you can say a prayer. You can believe in Jesus. You can believe that he died on the cross for your sins and was raised on a third day. You can believe in heaven and hell. And you know what? That will get you saved. It will get you into heaven because we're not saved by our works. We're not saved by our performance. We're saved by grace through faith. But what it won't do is it won't bring you into a state or a condition of maturity, which is exactly what God wants for you. It's like, think about a parent. A parent can raise a child and they can biologically be their child. And if they're 40 years old and they are fail to, failing to thrive, they're not, gonna, they're not gonna let them starve, they're not gonna let them die, but they're going to be disappointed because they see their child missing out on the purposes of God. They're living in their basement at 40 years old and they failed to thrive. It's like, I love you, I'm not gonna disown you, but come on, there was so much more for you. You see, if, all we, if our whole Christian experience in our relationship with God is just based around, well, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, then you're gonna live a miserable life because I believe the most miserable people on the planet are people who know the truth but don't walk in the truth. Ignorance, if you don't know anything about the Lord, then you can go through your life and you can have a semblance of morality, but the Bible says in Psalm 34, taste and see that the Lord is good. When you've had a taste of the goodness of God, and you don't go on to maturity, you are going to be the most miserable human being on the face of the earth because something on the inside of you is telling you that there is so much more. But we have to make the decision to step into those things. Notice what God told Joshua. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon shall be yours to take. What does that mean? It means in our lives, we've got to be the ones that take the initiative. There are places in our life that we have got to be willing to step into and deal with and confront that are outside of an overcoming mentality. What are the places of your life where you are not experiencing victory, you are not experiencing God's best, where there's still a residue of Egypt that has control on you? We can sit back all day long and say, well, I'm saved, I don't understand why so-and-so is thriving and they're growing and why am I stuck in the same place? God says, look, any area of your life that you're willing to take a step into and initiate, God says, I'll meet you there with kingdom change. But I'm not gonna take the step for you. You've gotta take the step. You can stand on the banks of the Jordan River and you can look at the promised land all day long, but the Jordan River is not gonna part until you step into it. And you'll never step into the place of God's fullness and his blessing and his kingdom coming to bear in all these different areas of our lives unless we take that step. That's an overcoming mentality. It's an overcoming spirit. It's a life that has been postured. Let me, let me say it this way. An overcoming mindset is a way of living that is inherently committed to the purposes of God. It is radically obedient to the word of God and it is totally and divinely empowered by the presence of God. That's an overcoming mentality. Let me encourage you, turn with me over into the book of Romans for a moment. Romans chapter eight in Romans chapter eight, in verse number seven and eight, it says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But jump down to verse number 13. It says, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. In other words, you're gonna wander in the wilderness until your corpse collapse. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all that are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. You weren't, created to go back into Egypt, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, 
heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we also may be glorified with him. This is an overcoming spirit. It's a Joshua mentality that says, I'm not gonna be satisfied with just being saved. I'm not gonna be satisfied with just being a slave that wanders in the wilderness. That I'm living off of just enough. I'm living you know, off of manna. God's providing just the bare necessities. Manna was just there to get them through the bridge of the wilderness until they could reap the harvest in the promised land. But they settled for the manna. A salvation mentality just says, well, I'm saved, I'm on my way to heaven, that's good enough. Now I'm living my life. How come things don't just change? It should just be automatic. A Joshua overcoming mentality says, no, God is with me and I'm stepping into every facet of my life with the presence of God and I'm going to bring it under the subjection of the kingdom of God. I'm not gonna walk according to the flesh. My mind, my carnal mind, the actions of the flesh that are driven by my appetites, I'm not gonna live like that anymore. That's a slave mentality. I, there is a new and a living way. Just like Joshua had a spirit of wisdom, there is a new and living way that the Spirit of God has made for you and I to live. We're sons and daughters of God. We were created to be led by the Spirit of God. We were not created to be led by our appetites. We were not created to operate in a hostility and enmity against God. We were created to walk in partnership with God. But we've got to respond to the invitation to arise and to cross over. Rise and cross over and to possess the promises that God has for us. You see, a Joshua mentality, number one, is inherently committed to the purposes and the people of God, just like Joshua was. Joshua's number one desire was I wanna please God. But you can't please God, we just saw Romans chapter eight. You can't please God when you're in the flesh. I've tried. And it doesn't work. Sometimes your carnal mind, you get great ideas. It's like, if I do this, God will be pleased with me. Or if I do this, this will impress God. You can't please God when you're in the flesh. Well, he knows my heart. Yeah, he knows your heart. That it's wicked and totally deceptive. The human heart, Jeremiah says that. God knows your heart. That's why he says he wants to give you a new heart. Well, how does he get a new heart? When we surrender our old heart. Well, God knows my intentions. Yeah, he knows your intentions. You can't please God in the flesh. What does it take? It takes an inherent commitment to the purposes and the people of God. Joshua was responsible for all of these people. Think about that for a moment. Up until this point, all Joshua had to do was wait on Moses. All Joshua had to do was when Moses went to the mountain to hear from God, Joshua went. He said, what did God say, Mo? God said this, great, and he could do it. He could live his life in excellence as long as he was told what to do. But now God is saying this, you don't have Moses to tell you what to do anymore. As I was with Moses, so I'm going to be with you. Only be strong and very courageous. Don't turn to the right or to the left. Be strong and very courageous. Meditate on the word of God. What did it require of Joshua? It required an inherent, deep-seated commitment to the purposes of God. What about you today? How committed are you to saying, God, every area of my life is surrender to you. And whatever you highlight, I'm gonna step into that. Wherever the sole of your foot treads, that shall be ground, that shall be territory for you to possess. What places of your life today have you been afraid to go? What areas, what, what things of your past what under, uh, unsurrendered ways of thinking have you kind of compartmentalized away from the Lord and you're actually hurting yourself? 
So let me just tell you, God's not gonna kick down the door of those places in your life. He's told you, if you'll step into those rooms, I'll step with you. And I'll bring them into the promises of God. I'll renew them, I will redeem them, I can make them beautiful again, but you have got to be committed to this. How committed are you to living out the purposes of God for your life right now, as opposed to asking God to bless your plans for yourself? You know, Proverbs talks about the plans of man. It says, we make our plans, but it's the counsel of the Lord that eventually stands. So if we're more committed to our plans than we are to the purposes of God, we're gonna continue to live in a salvation Moses mentality that will leave us being able to see the promises of God but not able to possess the promises of God. You see, a Joshua mentality or an overcoming mentality is radically committed to God's word. I love this. I love this part of it. He says, To Joshua, he says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you might be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous. Joshua had to be radically obedient to the word of God. God was gonna tell him to do some crazy things. Hey, Joshua, here's how you're gonna defeat Jericho when you go into the promised land high walls, thick walls. Filled with warriors. Here's what I want you to do. Are you ready? I want you to get everybody lined up and I want you to march around the city and I want you to shout. And I want you to do that seven days. And then I want you to do it a few extra times. Blow the trumpets when all the arrows are pointed down at you and all the javelins are held back. Instead of pulling back your javelin, I want you to pull back the veil and see and behold the face of your God and I want you to worship him. I want you to shout. And when you do it, I'm gonna knock down the walls. Sound like a deal? Well, Lord, that doesn't make sense. Of course it doesn't. But will you be radically obedient to my word? Because I'm not gonna give you another word until you've obeyed the last word. You see, the key to our success, and by the way, in America, we've got all kinds of wrong ideas about success. We think success is money. We think success is power. We think success is fame. We think success is being able to move to a community in Florida and play shuffleboard and have no responsibilities and just kind of die uh, our lives overlooking the lagoons and, you know, and, and never being able to, and never having to do anything that's inconvenient for us. That's not success. We can be successful in all the wrong things and failures in all the eternal things. And it will only be figured out in eternity. Success is being able to look Jesus in the eye someday and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Success may never show up as success on this side of eternity, but it's being radically obedient to the word of God. Yes, I'll march around Jericho. Yes, I won't take any of the silver or gold or the garments of Babylon. I won't do anything. It's all dedicated to the Lord. Yes, Lord, okay, we will carry the ark into the Jordan when it's overflowing its banks at the worst time of the year. It was not convenient. It's the worst time of the year to do this. And God says, here's how it's gonna happen. You'll step down into it, then I'll pull back the river. How many times in our life have we like uh, said to God, God, if you'll pull back the river, I'll walk through. He says, great, you step in, I'll pull it back. Lord, I'd rather you pull it back before I step into it. And he says, I know you'd rather do that. But do it my way. What river is God calling you to step into right now? How committed are we to the word of God? And so much so that God says, I want not you just meditating on the word, but I want it to be the words that you speak. I don't want the book of the law to depart from your mouth day or night. Christian, listen to me. Over the next four months, you are gonna have every opportunity to say a lot of things in a lot of different ways on a lot of different platforms about elections, politicians, news cycles, health, other Christians, other churches, people that aren't Christians, and you know what? A lot of it may actually be factual. Probably most of it 
is nothing but spam. And if we're not careful, we can say a lot of things that are temporarily factual, but not eternally true. And we can be guilty of not being radically obedient to the word of God because we're more committed to our own purposes or plans. We used to, used to have this thing that we did in high school, and for those of you who went to high school you know, 30 years ago or further back, uh, before there were wheels and fire, uh, you may have played this as well. We used to have this thing where, as friends, we would have conversations where the only way that you could answer was with either titles or lyrics from a song. So if somebody would say something, you had to answer with either the title or the lyrics to a song. It was the only way that you could answer. And you know, until you got somebody stuck and they tried to stretch it and it's like, that's not the words, like Elton John's Rocket Man or something like that and nobody knows the words to that. And you know, you're trying to quote it back and forth and you try to see how long you can go in a conversation where all it is is maybe a movie title or a, a song title or a lyric and you go back and forth. I wonder what would happen if we would limit our conversations to only scripture. How long could your conversation go? What if you made a decision that you were only going to limit the words that you say to the words in scripture that you already have in your heart? I'm not talking about, oh, I gotta say this, so digging in your concordance trying to find, okay, stone them all and smash the children's mouths on the rock. Okay, that makes sense. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you've got the word so deep in your heart that it's what naturally overflows your life. My grandfather, who I've talked about many times, he's about to turn 89 years old. And in some ways, he's not as sharp as he used to be in conversations. His uh, mind is slowing down, it's slipping. Sometimes he's not fully engaged, but he's read the Bible every day of his life since he was 19 years old. And when we go and visit my grandfather, my grandparents, sometimes he'll just be staring off into space. And then you begin to talk to him, the only things that he knows how to draw on is the words to a worship song and to scripture. And in spite of, he can't remember so-and-so's name and he doesn't remember this story and he doesn't remember sometimes the people who are in the room, but he'll get going and it flows out of the deep place of his spirit. It's the word of God and it's on his mouth. You can carry on a conversation with him that is just scripture or is just lyrics. He has memorized more hymns than I've ever sang. And I'm not talking about verses one and three and skipping two and five. He knows all five choruses and stanzas of all the songs of worship from his generation that are deeply embossed in his heart. I wonder what would happen if you and I had the word of God so deep, deeply entrenched into our soul and so on the tip of our tongue, our words seasoned with grace, speaking the truth of God's word, limiting what comes out of our mouth, not allowing the flesh and old slave language to flow out of us, I wonder if the world would be different. I wonder if our success would be different. I wonder if, I'm not talking about success as far as, oh, I can do this to get that. I'm talking about success as witnesses of Jesus. Success that the world looks at us and says, there's something different about them. Why is that person always quoting Bible? Why, why do they gotta do that? Why can't they just get down in the muck with the rest of us and, and post something really mean or really full of vitriol. How come the only nice people on Facebook are Christians? Wow, can you imagine if that was said? You see, if we're gonna have an overcoming mentality, we've gotta be inherently committed to the purposes and the people of God, but we've gotta be radically committed to God's word, not just to know it, but to obey it. To obey it. Do not be a hearer only, but a doer of the word of God. And finally, an overcoming spirit, an overcoming mentality is divinely empowered by God's abiding presence. Look at what he says multiple different times. Just as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. Wherever you go, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then right down here, verse number nine, he says, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. If we're gonna have an overcoming 
mentality. If we're going to go on into maturity, like Hebrews chapter 5 says, therefore let us lay aside the elementary teachings of Christ behind and let us move on to maturity. If we're going to go on to maturity, maturity is going to be incubated in a greater awareness of the empowerment of God's presence in us, with us, around us that goes before us, follows after us, and that there's nowhere that we can go that God's presence is not with us. This is the X factor. This is the X factor. It's God's presence, that we're carriers of his presence. That right now, wherever you are at, God is with you. God doesn't live in temples made with stone or steel or metal. God dwells in the temple of his people. His presence is with you. And his presence comes with his power. His power comes with his favor. His favor comes with his voice. And when we recognize and we allow ourselves to be divinely empowered by his abiding presence, it's what causes us to grow. It's what causes us to be divinely confident. See, Joshua had what I call compounded confidence because not only had he seen what God did in Moses but now he firsthand is seeing what God was desiring to do in him it was compounded confidence and you and I can have compounded confidence why because number one we see what God has done for others we see what God has done for Joshua we see what God has done for Moses We see what God has done for our friends, our family. But he doesn't want us to be secondhand followers of Jesus. He wants us to have firsthand awareness of his presence with us. Do you know what God is attracted to more than anything? It's not perfection. He already has that. In fact, he has the corner on it. God's not attracted to our wisdom. The only wisdom we have comes from him. God's not even attracted to gifts. He says, I don't want your burnt offerings, your sacrifices. You know what God wants? A broken and a contrite spirit. When we have a humble heart, the Bible says God is attracted to humility. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. He will lift you up. In due season, you will be exalted. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God is attracted to humility. Sometimes we can think of humility as being weakness. The strongest posture we can take in the presence of God. The strongest posture in relationship to God is to say, I have strong opinions, Lord. I have strong desires. I have strong appetites. I've got dreams. I've got opinions. But I'm more committed to your purposes than I am to my own. So I get low. I humble myself. Lord, I, my words can cut like a knife. My words can sound really good. I've got strong opinions. I'm educated. I've gone to school. I've got perspectives. But you know what? I submit my words to your word. I humble myself. And God, I, I feel like I've been successful. And I feel like I've done some pretty awesome things. I feel like just about everywhere I go, I'm, I can do a lot in my own strength and my own power. But today, I'm leaving that on this side of the Jordan. I'm leaving my way of doing things, the way that seems right to a man. I'm leaving my perspectives. I'm leaving my desires. I'm leaving my biases on this side of the Jordan and I'm rising up and I'm crossing over. 
I'm responding to your invitation, God. I want what you have for me. And so I humble myself. I say, Jesus, you are Lord. Your way is true. Your voice I will follow. I won't turn to the right or to the left. I'm gonna keep my eyes on you, Jesus. And when you say move, I move. Because I want to be an overcomer. Today, God's calling you to be an overcomer. Some of you who are watching right now, you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. When we talk about a salvation mentality, you've not even done that. You've not even had a moment where you've moved beyond just, I believe in the existence of God, to actually surrendering and recognizing that you need God's grace. You need his forgiveness. You see, every one of us are gonna stand before God someday and give an account for our lives and for our sin. You're either gonna stand before him guilty as charged, or you're gonna say, but even though I was guilty, Jesus paid it all. And I made Jesus Christ my Lord and my Savior, and therefore, I'm a child of God. That is the only answer on that day that is going to throw open the gates of the kingdom of God, throw open heaven for you. It's the only answer that will give you eternal life. And today, God's wanting you to surrender your pride. He's wanting you to not push it off into the distance. He's wanting you to lay down your skepticism and your doubt and your unbelief. He's wanting you to call on his name and say, Jesus, save me. Forgive me. I know I'm not right with God. And I don't want to, on that day, show up in my pride and my arrogance. On that day, I want to humble myself and say, Jesus, you paid it all. Wherever you're at, if you know you're not right with God, maybe you're today, you're someone who at one time, you followed Jesus, you went to church, you would, you would have said, I had a relationship with God. But you know what? You've been... You've been sidetracked and you've wandered in the wilderness. Maybe you've even made a return trip back to Egypt. And now like today, if you've never done it, you've never asked Jesus into your heart to be your Lord and your Savior, today's the day to do that. If you've walked away and you're a prodigal, today's the day to return. I wanna lead you in a prayer wherever you're at, right in your living room, by yourself, in front of other people, it doesn't matter. If you know you need to get right with God right now, I want you to pray this prayer with me wherever you're at. Say, Heavenly Father, I believe in Jesus, that he died on the cross in my place so that I could be forgiven. I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. I repent of living for myself and I give it all to you, Lord. Save me. Forgive me, cleanse me, fill me with your Holy Spirit and write my name in the book of life. From this day forward, I belong to you. Thank you for loving me, saving me in Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you just prayed that prayer, I want you to know that heavens and the heavens are rejoicing right now and we wanna rejoice with them and rejoice with you. Wherever you're at right now, just text the number on your screen and let us know that you just made that decision. You just gave God your yes today. The angels in heaven are rejoicing. We want you to know Radiant Church is rejoicing with you as well.